Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina, and this is my lecture on infertility. To download my lecture, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. The main reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology 7th Edition, Chapter 42, Infertility. This is the outline of my lecture. So first, we define what is infertility. Infertility is defined as the inability of a couple to conceive after one year of trying. However, this one year is shortened to six months if the female partner is at least 35 years old and above, has oligo or amenorrhea, has a known tubal obstruction, has a known uterine disease, has a di is diagnosed with severe endometriosis, or if the male partner has a known male factor infertility. Now, why do we wait for one year? before we evaluate these couples for infertility. It is because that approximately only 50% of the couples will conceive in about 3 months, 75% will conceive in 6 months, and by 1 year, approximately 90% of these couples will have conceived. Fecundability is a term we use to denote the monthly conception rate, and this is pegged at 20% for normal or fertile couples. So what does this mean? It means that for a normal, fertile couple, their chances of getting pregnant per cycle is just about 20%. Now, this figure is very important for all couples seeking fertility to know because it will alleviate unrealistic expectations of immediate success with various therapies, which can only approach 20% per cycle. Impaired fecundity is a more general term apply, applying to all women who have difficulty conceiving or carrying a pregnancy to term. And unexplained infertility is the type of infertility with no specific diagnosed cause of infertility. It means that after all the workups are done, then we find no specific cause for the infertility for the couple. Data from both older and more recent studies have indicated that the percentage of infertile couples increases with increasing age of the female partner. Remember, the age of the female partner is the most important factor to consider. So, you see this, you see here in this table that as the female partner's age increases, the percentage of infertility or the incidence of infertility also increases. Here are the causes of infertility. The exact incidence of the various factors causing infertility varies among different populations and cannot be precisely determined. It is reported that among 14,141 couples in 21 publications, ovulatory disorders occurred in about 27% of the time, male factors in 25%, tubal disorders in 22%, endometriosis in 5%, unexplained factors in about 17%, and other factors at 5%. So let us discuss some of the diagnostic modalities we use for infertility. So the first two in the list of diagnostic modalities is of course obtaining the couple's medical history and physical examination. History and PE of infertility should be thorough and completed as rapidly as possible. And during the initial interview, the couple should be informed about normal human fecundity and how these pro probabilities decrease with increasing age of the female partner and with the duration of infertility. The various tests in the diagnostic evaluation and why they are performed should also be thoroughly explained. The available therapies and prognosis for treatment of the various causes of infertility should also be included in the dialogue. The couple should be informed that after a complete diagnostic infertility evaluation, the cause for infertility cannot be determined in a large group of couples. For many couples, the reduced fecundability can be suggested to be age-related. So first, for the couple's medical history, of course, we ask or we determine the type of infertility, whether it's primary or secondary, and its duration. So we also ask about the history of previous pregnancies and their outcomes, obtain history of previous infertility evaluation and treatment, and this will, should include details about frequency of intercourse and the presence of any sexual dysfunction. We also ask about 
uh, the menstrual history of the female partner, including the frequency and pattern since menarche, as well as history of weight changes, hirsutism, frontal balding, and acne. We also obtain, of course, the male medical history, including previous semen analysis results, history of impotence, premature ejaculation, change in libido, history of testicular trauma, previous relationships, history of any previous pregnancy in female partners, and the existence of offspring from previous female partners. We also ask about the couple's history of sexually transmitted diseases, about surgical contraception done in the past, about their lifestyle, whether they consume alcohol, um, smoke tobacco, and do recreational drugs, what is their occupation, and ask also about their physical activities. We also ask the female partner about the history of abdominal or pelvic surgery or history of chemotherapy or radiation. We also ask about the couple's current medical treatment, if there's any, and the reason for that uh, medical treatment they're undergoing, and any history of allergies. And also, we do a complete review of systems to identify any endocrinologic or immunologic issues that may be associated with infertility. Now, for the couple's physical exam, we should also obtain uh, or determine the uh, couple's vital signs, the height, weight, and of course, the BMI. We should do a head and neck assessment. Uh, we, we should uh, in inspect for the presence of exophthalmos that can be associated with hyperthyroidism, the presence of epicanthus, lower implantation of ears and hairline, and web neck can be associated with chromosomal abnormalities such as a Turner syndrome. And we also exclude thyroid gland enlargement or nodules which may indicate thyroid dysfunction. We do a thorough breast evaluation. We have to assess breast development and seek any abnormal masses or secretions, especially galactorrhea. We also do uh, abdominal uh, evaluation and assess for the presence of abnormal masses. For the dermatologic evaluation, we have to assess for the presence of acne, hypertrichosis, and hirsutism, which could signify presence of PCOS. We should also do a thorough gynecologic evaluation and assess for hair distribution, clitoris size, uh, assess for the Bartholin's glands, the labia majora and minora, and any condyloma, acuminata, or other lesions that could indicate the existence of venereal disease. For the speculum examination, we... We establish the direction of the cervix plus the size and position of the uterus on bimanual examination to exclude the presence of uterine fibroids, adnexal masses, tenderness, or pelvic nodules indicative of infection or endometriosis. We also assess for defects such as absence of vagina in uterus and also a vaginal septum. For the extremities or evaluation of the extremities, we exclude malformations such as shortness of the fourth finger or cubitus valgus, which you know is part of uh, the Turner syndrome and um, other congenital defects. The urologist usually examines the male partner if the patient's history of a semen analysis produces an abnormal finding. Attention should be directed to congenital abnormalities of the genital tract, such as hypospadia, cryptorchidism, and congenital absence of the vas deferens. Testicular size, urethral stenosis, and presence of a recocil are also determined. And also, a history of previous inguinal hernia repair can indicate an accidental ligation of the spermatic artery. The third step is to document ovulation, and here are some of the ways. Of course, preliminary information that the woman is ovulatory is provided by a history of regular menstrual cycles. So if the patient has regular menstrual cycles, then chances are she is ovulatory. Now, if the woman has regular menstrual cycles, a serum progesterone level should be measured in the mid-luteal phase to provide indirect evidence of ovulation as well as normal luteal function. But above it all, the best evidence of ovulation is of course pregnancy. Now, let's take a closer look at uh, some of these methods. Basal body temperature is an indirect evidence that ovulation has taken place. This provides information about the approximate day of ovulation and duration of the luteal phase. 
The temperature should be taken shortly after awakening only after at least 6 hours of sleep and prior to ambulating with sublingual placement of a special thermometer with gradients between 96 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So after plotting the temperature every day for one cycle, we have two uh, patterns, the ovulatory pattern and the anovulatory pattern. So a biphasic pattern is what we see in this graph where you see uh, two peaks. So that's the biphasic pattern. So that signifies that this patient is ovulatory. However, if you only have one peak, then that's a monophasic pattern which signifies that the patient might be anovulatory. Second is a urinary luteinizing hormone determination or what we call the LH kits or the ovulation kits. This identifies the mid-cycle LH surge and this provides indirect evidence of ovulation. This will help us define the interval of the greatest fertility, which is the day of the LH surge and the next day. Meaning, if you use this LH kit, the day that the kit tested positive and the following day. That will be the interval of greatest fertility. So this is best done using midday urine specimen, discarding the first urine output of, uh, of the morning. Next is endometrial biopsy, and this is also called endometrial dating. So when we do endometrial biopsy and we obtain uh, secretory endometrium, then this is indirect evidence of ovulation. Why is that so? You know that secretory endometrium happens during the second half of the cycle, right? So secretory endometrium is a manifestation of the influence of progesterone. Progesterone is produced by the corpus luteum, which is a byproduct of ovulation. However, endometrial biopsy is no longer recommended as this is very invasive. And um, this is the reason why it is no longer recommended as part of the infertility evaluation. Ultrasound or follicle monitoring is a direct evidence of ovulation. And uh, one of the evidence of ovulation is, of course, the corpus luteum. This is usually done every other day, starting from uh, menstrual day 10 or day 12. Ultrasound can also detect significant pathologies such as fibroids, endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, and other pathology that can possibly affect fertility. And this ultrasound can also be used to determine antral follicle count as uh, assessment for ovarian reserve. Next is determination of ovarian reserve or what we call ovarian reserve test. Ovarian reserve tests should not be routinely done for all infertility couples or for all infertility female patients. This is done only for female patients who are or who have the following conditions. Those female partners who are 45 years old and above, those with history of pelvic or ovarian surgery, those with a history of chemotherapy, those with a family history of early menopause or premature ovarian failure, females with history of poor response to infertility treatment, or for couples who are planning to undergo ART or in vitro fertilization. So what are the kinds of ovarian reserve tests? Of course, the most common and the cheapest would be day 3 FSH and day 3 estradiol. So we want day 3 FSH to be less than or equal to 10. If the day 3 FSH is more than 10, then that uh, signifies poor ovarian reserve. Uh, day 3 estradiol, we want it to be less than 80. Okay, so we also do chromophene side rate challenge test an antral follicle count or AFC and the normal antral follicle count should be more than 12. The gold standard is of course anti-mullerian hormone and we want an anti-mullerian hormone level to be around uh, more than 1 nanogram per ml. We also can do tubal patency tests. and this is through chromotubation, through exploratory laparotomy or laparoscopy through hysterosalpingogram or HSG or through sonohysterosalpingogram or what we call SISH or saline infusion sonohysterogram.
Here are examples of hysterosalpingogram images. So in a hysterosalpingogram, we insert a catheter into the endometrial cavity through the cervix, of course. And through that catheter, we inject um, a fluid or a dye. And then through real-time fluoroscopic imaging, we look or observe how that dye passes through the endometrial cavity and through both fallopian tubes. So in this picture on the right, on your right, you see that the dye has passed through both left and the right fallopian tubes. And this is what we call patent bilateral fallopian tubes. When you look at the picture in this lower left side, so we see here that the endometrial cavity has uh, was filled up by the dye, but there is no egress of fluid or dye into both fallopian tubes. And this is what we call bilateral um, blocked fallopian tubes. So in the other picture here on the lower right, these are also bilaterally blocked fallopian tube, but this is a uh, distal occlusion. In the picture on the lower left, this is what we call a um, uh, proximal tubal occlusion. The next test that we can do is the postcoital test or what we call PCT or the Simpsoner test. This is a very subjective test and nowadays we don't usually do this as part of the infertility investigation. So a normal PCT is one in which at least five bottle sperm are visible in normal cervical mucus obtained from the upper cervical canal just prior to ovulation. A suboptimal test can be the result of technique timing of the test, and problems with cervical mucus or with sperm. Although a good PCT has been correlated with a better prognosis for pregnancy, sperm have been recovered at laparoscopy when there was a poor PCT. Moreover, because the suggested treatment for a poor PCT is intrauterine insemination after ovarian stimulation, this is the exact next step taken, even if the PCT is normal, in the setting of unexplained infertility. Occasionally, as may happen with an Orthodox Jewish couple, a semen analysis cannot be obtained. So here, a PCT provides a surrogate for visualizing motile, non- or normal-appearing sperm. The next important diagnostic modality that we need is, of course, the semen analysis. Although information about ovulation is being obtained, the male partner's reproductive system should be evaluated by means of a semen analysis. Abnormalities in the semen analysis or male factor occurs in approximately 20% of couples with infertility as the sole factor and may be involved in 30% to 40% of cases overall. The male partner should be advised to abstain from ejaculation for 2-3 to three days before collection of the sperm or the semen sample. It is best to collect the specimen in a clean but not necessarily sterile wide mouth jar after masturbation. It is important that the entire specimen be collected because the initial fraction contains the greatest density of sperm. Ideally, collection should take place in a location where the analysis will be performed. The degree of sperm motility should be determined as soon as possible after liquefaction, which usually occurs 15 to 20 minutes after ejaculation. Sperm motility begins to decline 2 hours after ejaculation and it is best to examine the specimen within this period. Semen should not be exposed to marked changes in temperature and if collected at home during cold weather, the specimen should be kept warm during transport to the laboratory. Parameters used to evaluate the semen include volume, viscosity, sperm density, sperm morphology, and sperm motility. The last parameter should be evaluated in terms of percentage of total motile sperm as well as quality of motility, that's the rapidity of movement and amount of progressive motility. Sperm morphology is an extremely important parameter which is correlated to fertilizing ability. Using the strict criteria, only approximately 4% or more of the sperm in an ejaculate may be considered normal according to the most recent WHO criteria. Now, this is the WHO criteria for semen analysis. So the most important here would be to know the sperm count, of course, in the form of sperm concentration, motility, and percent normal forms.
In cases of poor semen quality or abnormal semen analysis findings, it is best to repeat the test at least once if an abnormality is found. If abnormalities persist, then the male should have a urologic exam or should be referred to a urologist. Comprehensive evaluation should include a history and physical exam, Hormonal evaluation including LH, FSH, testosterone, estradiol, prolactin, and TSH. And this will also include genetic abnormalities or screening for genetic abnormalities, particularly with severe sperm abnormalities. We can also do chlamydia antibody titers. So if elevated, this may signify the possibility of tubal disease. If the immunoglobulin G or IgG antibody titer is greater than 1 is to 32, then that means that 35% of patients may have evidence of tubal damage. Other tests that we can include or other additional laboratory procedures that uh, we can do are the following. So we can measure TSH and prolactin levels in ovulatory women if not already done. Luteal phase endometrial biopsy, which we also um, already discussed. Measurement of anti-sperm antibodies in the male and female partner. Bacteriologic cultures and other sperm testing. So now we discuss treatment. So treatment, of course, will depend on the cause of infertility. So if the cause is anovulation, then of course, we have to give treatment that will induce ovulation, such as ovulatory drugs or a surgical procedure such as laparoscopic ovarian drilling. So for ovulatory drugs, the most common that we give are quamifin citrate, aromatase inhibitors, and gonadotropins. Laparoscopic ovarian drilling is done for PCOS patients. Now, if the anovulation is secondary to hypothyroidism, then we correct the thyroid disorder. If the anovulation is secondary to hyperprolactinemia, then of course, we correct the hyperprolactinemia by giving bromocryptine. So what are the mechanism of action or the mechanisms of action for both clomiphene citrate and aromatase inhibitors in the form of letrozole? So clomiphene citrate is actually the usual first-line pharmacologic agent for treating women with oleg oligomenorrhea and those with amenorrhea who have sufficient ovarian estrogen production. Clomiphene citrate is actually a racemic mixture of N and zooclomiphene, which act as estrogen antagonist. The former has a shorter half-life and is more active than the zooclomiphene isomer, which has some more or much longer half-life and is more estrogen agonistic than antagonistic. Clomiphene citrate acts by competing with endogenous circulating estrogens for estrogen binding sites on the hypothalamus, thereby blocking the negative feedback of endogenous estrogen. GnRH is then released in a normal manner, stimulating FSH and LH, which in turn cause oocyte maturation with increased uh, estradiol production. This drug is usually given for 5 days beginning 3 to 5 days after the onset of spontaneous menses or withdrawal bleeding induced with a progestogen. Now, for aromatase inhibitors or letrozole, the mechanism of action is that of inhibition of estrogen production during the five days of administration with the negative feedback causing an increase in FSH levels, much like the response to clomiphene citrate. Now, intraovarian androgen levels are also increased, which may enhance FSH sensitivity. Letrozole uh, is administered for five days just, just like clomiphene citrate beginning cycle days three to five. Gonadotropins, on the other hand, are indicated for ovulation induction when estrogen levels are low and when there is no response to clomiphene citrate or letrozole. Low serum estradiol levels or lack of withdrawal bleeding after progestogen administration signifies a state that will be unresponsive to oral therapies such as clomiphene citrate or letrozole because gonadotropin is, of course, an injectable hormone. 
uh, we use gonadotropins when there is resistance to comifin citrate or letrozole. Gonadotropins have also been used when there has been the inability to conceive after several cycles of um, comifin citrate or letrozole, although this indication is not as frequently applied today. Now, laparoscopic ovarian drilling or ovarian diathermy is an alternative to gonadotropin therapy in clomiphene-resistant women with PCOS. Laparoscopic electrical or laser-generated burn holes uh, through the ovarian cortex have been associated with improving ovulation rates. Major advantage of this more invasive method of ovarian electrocauterization is that it decreases the risk of hyperstimulation and multiple pregnancies. In addition to a concern of surgical complications, excessive destruction of the ovarian cortex can lead to premature ovarian failure. That's why we only do a limited number of burn holes of burning holes about uh, less than or equal to 10. One of the treatment modalities for infertility is, of course, weight and lifestyle management for the obese patient. This is particular in women who are clomiphene resistant and, of course, weight loss in these cases will ameliorate the situation. So in overweight women, it is important to ensure that abnormalities in glucose and lipid metabolism are normalized as much as possible before induction of ovulation. And lifestyle changes in diet and exercise may improve overall fitness and metabolic parameters as well as ovulatory responses. Now for tubal block, of course short of doing IVF, which is the last resort, then we can also do tubal surgery. Usually we do um, salpingoneostomy or repair the, the distal block or the distal occlusion, to open the distal occlusion, and that is what we call tubal surgery. For male factor infertility, this is the general algorithm for the diagnostic evaluation of male infertility. So first, of course, we do a thorough physical, and, uh, physical exam in history. If uh, the semen analysis is normal, then of course, we proceed to um, evaluating the female partner but if the semen analysis uh, turns out to have abnormal results then as um, mentioned in a previous slide we do a thorough hormone evaluation and of course eliminate the gonadotoxins if there's no improvement after eliminating gonadotoxins then we do further evaluation based on semen analysis so we also, of course, treat the female factor if there's improvement with elimination of gonadotoxins. This is the general algorithm for the treatment of male infertility. Of course, if he has a medical problem that is the cause for the infertility, then of course we treat that first. But if there's none, then the other options would be to correct the male factor for example, if he has varicocele, there's um, obstruction, if there's a hormone abnormality, infection, or other exposure. Other treatment options would be intrauterine insemination, IVF, or IVF XC, depending on the cause of the male infertility. So if the male partner has a testicular problems, maybe we can refer this patient to a urologist for a possible testicular surgery. If he is oligospermic, then one of the treatment options would be to do intrauterine insemination for, for the couple, of course. And if he is uh, severely oligospermic or has non-obstructive azoospermia or obstructive azoospermia, then... Uh, the couple might should be um, referred to an IVF specialist for uh, in vitro fertilization. For unexplained infertility, the options would be doing uh, ovulation induction with or without intrauterine insemination or proceeding directly to in vitro fertilization. So that's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Doc Ina Thank you.